as I was reflecting upon all the things that I am thankful for, quickly struck me that I want to publicly express my appreciation to the youth group. As I was reflecting back upon the blessings of this past week, I want to let this congregation know that the youth of this congregation did an outstanding job of representing this church family. The way that they behaved themselves, the way that they uh, conducted themselves, the way that they interacted with one another, I want to let you know that it causes me great joy to be able to publicly say that. I know that Mark and Allison are doing an outstanding job working with these young people. As we reflect back upon the theme of this last week, it was the theme of unstoppable. And in our morning sessions, we began to look at the unstoppable gospel, to understand that we have a mission and a message, to understand that we need courage, to understand that we're going to have an impact uh, through the gospel with everyone that we come into contact with. In our afternoon sessions, we had our heart-to-hearts in which we looked at ways that we can be ready to aid and to assist other individuals as we have opportunity to minister. In our evening worship, we had an opportunity to continue with our theme of unstoppable. And last Sunday night, I began to talk about this very sermon, at least a rendition of it, so you can sleep through the first little bit, youth group, but then you got to wake back up, okay? And so we began to talk about that of unstoppable unity, We begin to talk about unstoppable love, to talk about unstoppable trust, to talk about an unstoppable purpose. And as we begin to think about this theme, I realize that it's not just a theme that is true for young people. It's a theme that is true for God's people. It is a theme that is true for everyone, regardless of your age, regardless of the circumstance or the phase in which you find yourself. I love what David wrote in Psalm 133, verses 1 through 3. He says, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. I want you to say this with me. Behold. I want you to say this with me. (laughs) Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. I believe that this is a scripture that needs to scream out to the church today. This is a concept, a biblical idea that God has given us that we need to heed, that we need to find ways to apply to our very lives. You see, we know this scripture to be true. We know that it is good. We know that it is pleasant whenever we get along. We know that it is good whenever we get along. We understand that it's, it's a beautiful thing when there's a lack of conflict. When individuals can come together, the church family can come together and can dwell in peace and harmony. I love this Calvin and Hobbes because as I saw this, I thought, you know, this is true. We can come up and we can talk about unity and we can talk about how pleasant it is. But the truth of the matter is, is that at some point in our lives, we're going to have conflict. We're going to have conflict with one another, and we've got to learn about how to repair them. Parents, I want to challenge you that is whenever we have a disagreement with our spouse, that we conduct ourselves in such a way in which our children can see how we resolve that conflict. I want to challenge us that whenever our children have conflict with one another or with someone else, that we begin to teach them how to properly and adequately resolve that conflict. To know that unity is the very core of what the, is at the, the very core of the Christian faith. And we need to do everything that we can to make sure that that occurs. As we looked in Philippians chapter 4, as it was read, we begin to find out and we read about that of Eodia and Synthache. We know that as Paul finds himself there in prison, we know that he finds himself being chained to that of the guards on four different shifts, six hours a day, that as they were there together, 24 hours, that all of a sudden, the church there at Philippi begins to send that of Epaphroditus. Sends Epaphroditus over, and he begins to go and to minister to Paul. As you begin to read throughout this book, you begin to see about some of the topics, some of the conversations in which these men had. I have no doubt that within their discussions, all of a sudden, Epaphroditus began to tell him about two ladies within the church there in Philippi that were having a conflict. And so all of a sudden, within there in Philippians chapter 4, Paul uses his 12-word sentence to do everything that he can from afar to help them reconcile, to allow them to overcome this strained relationship. 
what Paul writes there is he says, I entreat Euodia and I entreat Synthache to agree together in the Lord. As we begin to think about this idea of entreat, this word carries it with it the idea that of I strongly desire. This is nothing that I want more. I have this strong desire. I am praying for you. I am summoning the powers of everything and everyone to come together and to help you to overcome the conflict that you have. As we begin to read on, we begin to think, well, what do we know about these two women? And I, and I present to you this morning that at first, it doesn't seem like we know much about them at all. But then we, it seems to be not a lot of detail. But then as you look there in verse 3, all of a sudden, in fact, the, the bottom of the slide there, you begin to see that these are women who contended at the side of Paul for the cause of the gospel. And so as I read that, I may not know what they look like. I may not know their history. I may not know a lot about them. But I know that these are two ladies who love the Lord. I know that these are two ladies that were involved in ministry. I know that these are two ladies that cared deeply about Paul and about the ministry and the mission that he was striving to fulfill for the cause of Jesus Christ. Paul begins to give them a solution to their problem. He very simply says, agree together within the Lord. Agree together within the Lord. In other words, put aside your selfish desires. Put aside your earthly ways. I want you to focus upon Jesus. Focus upon the mission and the ministry. Agree together within the Lord. But then he says something else. He says, and I want to enlist the help of my loyal yoke fellow to help these ladies out. I don't know about you guys, but I would not want to have been called out within that letter to be the one to try to help these two ladies resolve their conflict. As many of you know, my daughter just turned six. And as I began to see, and I know, I know what's going to happen in the future. I've been told about it for years. But as I think about the conflict that my wife and my daughter can have, not because of my wife, let me make that crystal clear, but as I begin to see the conflict that can occur within these two women, there's times in which I just want to go upstairs. I don't want to be around it. I don't want to try to resolve it other than say, Kenzie, don't you disrespect your mother? And then boom, upstairs I go. Y'all work it out, right? And so that's what Paul begins to say here. We don't know who it is. We don't know if it's Luke. We don't know if it's Epaphroditus. We don't know who it is. But he does present the truth that sometimes we need someone else to help us reconcile the differences that we have with someone else. You know, one of the things that I don't like getting is a splinter. I don't like getting a splinter. I don't like getting a paper cut, and I'm not going to say what I did a couple of months ago to the Wileys, okay? Uh, I don't like getting paper cuts. I don't like getting splinters, because as these splinters begin to get within our finger, all of a sudden they, they ache, right? It can start off, that one actually looks nice. There were some photos I found on Google that would have made your stomach sick, so you're welcome this morning, okay? But all of a sudden we see this splinter, and we know that if we leave that splinter there, that it begins to get red, and it begins to get sore, and it begins to get infected. How do we take care of that? The best way to get rid of that pain is to remove the source, is to remove that splinter, is to, to get it out of there, right? Is to be able to get that completely, to remove it. And I believe that's what Paul is saying here to these two ladies, is whatever the source of your problem is, you need to get rid of it. You need to be willing to put it aside. Don't allow this rift, this dispute that's going on between you. It's already starting to spread to the church. It's already starting to spread to other individuals and to other persons. And so I entreat you. I am begging of you. I am praying for you. I am summoning that you will do whatever it takes to remove this conflict that you two ladies have. As we think about this concept of unity... I want us to understand that we find all throughout the scripture that God wants his people to be unified. That God wants his people to be unified. We find there in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9, in which Jesus is preaching, he said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. 
those who are peacemakers, those who allow unity to be at the core of who they are, those individuals that push aside that of the conflict or they work through it, these are the ones that shall be called sons of God. If you would turn to Ephesians 4, not Ephesians 6, but to Ephesians 4 with me, I want to read the first few verses of Ephesians 4. You see, in Ephesians 4, as is, is, is Paul is writing this to the church of Ephesus, he begins in verse 1. He says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. I urge you to walk in a manner worthy. The way that you live your lives, the way that people perceive you, verse 2, with all humility and with gentleness and with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain, notice, the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Paul says, look, I want you to have hearts that are humble. I want you to live lives that are unified. I want you to be gentle. I want you to, to demonstrate that of patience with one another. Why? Because God wants us to be unified. God wants us to be together. We begin to see that Paul also prayed for unity. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, Paul says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you may be unified in the same mind and in the same judgment. Man, when I read those words from Paul, I'm taken back a little bit saying, man, Paul, do, do you know what you charged us with? Do you know the, 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 uh, the, the, how high you set the bar as we think about the lives that we're to live, to be individuals that there are no divisions among us? that everyone is on the same page, that everyone is together, and that we can have the same mind and the same judgment. Paul went on in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. He says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts. He says, Put on kindness and humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgive each other, as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive, and above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Paul understood the value of unity. Paul understood the value of forgiveness. Paul understood the value of being willing to, to put on kindness and humility and meekness. He understood the value in this. As you think about all the congregations that he had worked with, you think about all the people that he had ministered to, he understood the value in what, was a, what could come from this type of heart being manifested throughout their lives. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but as I began to read through this, this passage and through this text, I was reminded of these simple truths about how to settle conflicts, about what are the ways to do it, because I have to tell you, that is, when you begin to look at some examples of how some individuals take care of conflict, I don't believe that it lines up with what we find here in Scripture. The first thing I want to present to you is the idea, if there's conflict between you and someone else, is to deal with it personally. To deal with it personally. Now, when we read this, we think, oh, I, you know, I, I, just, I don't like confrontation, Right? I don't like to confront individuals if I've wronged them or if they've wronged me. Maybe if I just remain silent. Maybe if I just, uh, you know, just kind of ignore it. Maybe it will go away. But what we find here in the text is that we need to deal with it personally. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15, he says, if your brother sins against you, then you go and reprove him in private. If he listens to you, then you have won your brother. In Matthew chapter 5, 23 and 24, we actually find where the situation is reversed. That if we find out that a brother has a problem against us, that we need to go and to try to do everything that we can to reconcile that problem between us and that other individual. You know what the text doesn't say to do? The text does not say anywhere that I've read in Scripture to take our problems to social media. It's never said, hey, let's go gossip and slander about someone on social media. Let's put it out there on uh, Facebook. Let's put it out there on Twitter. Maybe we can find a, a graphic of them and put it out there on Instagram, whatever, whatever it may be. In fact, as I was preaching this sermon Sunday night, I actually asked the kids, I said, um, you know, how many of you have seen adults 
take their problems with someone else and put it out there on social media. And I can tell you about three-fourths of the camp raised their hand. And then I asked a question, and, and, and adults, please, please hear me on this. And then I asked a question, I said, what kind of words, how does that make you feel whenever you see adults taking their, their gossip and their slander and putting it out there? And some of the terms that I heard is it said it makes them angry. It makes them mad to see adults behave that way. Other kid raised his hand, it makes them, he said, it makes me sad whenever I begin to see adults behave this way. Another kid raised his hand and says, it's embarrassing. Can we agree with that, church? It's embarrassing whenever we read and we begin to see things on social media about people behaving in a way that they should not do. One simple truth that I hope we all can burn into our minds is no matter where we are, we can be there in our home, on our device, on our laptop, whatever it is, but whenever we post something on social media, guys, it's out there. It's out there. And you may think only a small group of people are seeing it. I want to tell you that that could not be further from the truth. But to understand that as we think about dealing with our problems personally, it's so important because it does spread. It's something that needs to be resolved. Number two, deal with the issue at hand. Deal with the issue at hand. If we're going to be really honest with one another, a lot of times we get into an argument, and it may about be about subject number one, right? We're upset about this issue here. Well, next thing you know is we're dealing with this issue. All of a sudden, we feel like we're losing the debate. And so next thing you know, instead of dealing with this issue at hand, all of a sudden we pull in our mother-in-law, and we pull in our father-in-law, and we pull up things that happened three years ago. And we pull in this situation and that situation, and next thing you know, we're arguing about stuff that has nothing to deal with the issue at hand. And so Paul says, ladies, I want you to resolve your conflict. I want you to deal with the issue that is at hand. As we begin to think about this issue, we don't know if it was a personal wrong. We don't know if Synthache had done something to Yodia. We don't know if there's a personal wrong there. It may have been a personality clash. Maybe just something about their, their makeup caused them to, to not get along for there to be that clash. Maybe they had a methodology difference. She skins the cat this way, she skins the cat that way, right? And so all of a sudden there was conflict there. Maybe it was a doctrinal difference. Maybe all of a sudden she held this view, the other one held that view, and there was a conflict there. Maybe it was a combination of all of the things above. But we've got to deal with it personally. We've got to deal with the issue at hand. And the third, I want to suggest that we've got to deal with it with a heart of humility. You know, I can tell you that every argument I get into or disagreement, I feel like I'm right. I feel like I'm right. But then I was reminded of what the proverb writer said in Proverbs 18 and verse 17. He says, the first to plead his case seems just. Right? The first one to plead his case seems just, seems right until another comes and examines him. You know, there's a lot of times, that, in fact, most of the times I think I'm right. But there are times in which all of a sudden I found out that I was wrong, that I said some things that I did not mean to say. I said it in a way that I, I, I did not mean to. And all of a sudden, as we are presented with that, we have to, to be willing to be humble, to be meek, to realize that we are not perfect, to admit that we, we may have contributed to the problem, to understand that the goal is not to win a debate, to be repair a relationship. And that's what I put on number four. Our goal is peace and harmony. Our goal is that of reconciliation. And so I want to look at the question now of why does unity matter? Why is it that unity matters? What is it that is so important about unity? If you begin to read in John chapter 13 and John chapter 14, we see where Jesus is there with his disciples, and we find out that the apostles are afraid. They're terrified because they have learned that Jesus says that, it's going to, that he's about to leave. But all of a sudden, he makes a, a, a statement in John chapter 14, in verse 12, that I have to tell you is mind-boggling to me is mind-boggling to me. In fact, we see there in John 14, 12, he says, very truly I tell you, again, talking to the apostles, that whoever believes in me will do the works that I've been doing and that they will do even, notice that word, they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. 
Now, when I begin to read this passage, this is one of those verses that a lot of times I just kind of skimmed over. I was like, yes, Jesus is getting ready to leave. We know what happens at the end of the book. And so all of a sudden, he's trying to calm down the fears and the concerns of his disciples. He's commissioning them to continue on with the mission. And then all of a sudden, I come across this word that they're going to do even greater things than what Jesus did. I'm boggled by that. I'm boggled because whenever I begin thinking about the, the ministry of Jesus, and please understand, I'm not diminishing the power or the position of Jesus. But Jesus says, look, I have been here some three years as far as my ministry with you. And you think about the lives that we've impacted. You think about the people that we have touched. You think about the relationships with the Heavenly Father that have been restored. But I want to let you know that when the Holy Spirit comes and he empowers you, I want to let you know that even greater things are going to happen within the time that I was here. That's mind-boggling for me. To think about what the Spirit was able to do throughout these individuals. And then all of a sudden, you are going to read later in John chapter 17, he says, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who may, will believe in me. Okay, now, John 13, 14, all of a sudden, he's dealing with the apostles. Then, but by the time he gets to John chapter 17, church, he's talking about us here. He's talking about us. And he says, my prayer is not for them alone, but I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. You know, futuristic. You and I. I'm praying for those, those believers. I'm praying for those who will believe in me that all of them may be one. Jesus himself is saying, Father, I pray that my believers, uh, my prayer is that the church will be one, that we will be unified, that they will be able to be an example, be able to be a witness in the biblical sense, that they will be able to, to tell people and to model what I have done. He says, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may you also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. If you will notice after the first yellow highlight there where he says, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. I remember Brother Trent Adams uh, a couple of months back talking about this passage. And I remember him talking about and challenging us with the idea that as we think about unity, right, as we think about this concept of unity, he doesn't take it to a level that just stops at getting along. It's not about just getting along, but Jesus gives the model. He gives us the example. He says that the may believers be one just as you are in me and I am in you. That the idea of God the Father, Jesus together, that they are so tight that they are so unified together in mission and in purpose, be able to be so tight, so close together. Man, when I read that passage, I realize I got a lot of work to do. I got a lot of work to do. Because for me, the idea of unity is, well, there's no conflict, so things may just be doing okay, right? But no, Jesus says, look at my relationship with the Father Look at how close we are, how intimate we are, how unified we are together. But here's what I want you to remember also today. So that the world may believe that you have sent me, final highlight, then the world will know that you sent me. Church, I want to tell you, this is one of those passages that, that we may have missed the mark. As we think about our efforts, effort, excuse me, for evangelism, as we think about the, the uh, passing out the flyers for VBS, as we think about putting things out on social media, inviting people to VBS, as we think about the, uh, the, the, uh, the seminar that we had recently, as we think about our Wednesday night series, as we think about all the wonderful things that we have going on as a church, I think a lot of times we think, how is it that we can bring people to Jesus, right? And so I begin thinking about that, and I'm like, well, maybe, maybe it's just about having an incredible apologetics, Right, So that people will believe in Jesus. It's about apologetics. And so we're going to be able to, to answer all their questions and they'll come to Jesus. That's good. 
And then I think, well, maybe we can show them in Scripture about all the miracles and the ways that confirmed the Word and, and how the church grew, and that's good. But church, see what he says here. Jesus himself says, if you want the world to believe that I am he, that I am the Savior, that I am the Messiah, then it is done through our unity. The way that we minister to one another, the way that we get along with one another, the way that we talk about the church, the way that we talk about our brothers and sisters in Christ, the way that we grieve together, the way that we rejoice together, the way that we are church, Jesus says, this is how they will know that you have sent me. In 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5, it says, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also are like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. For my son's birthday last year, we went to a place that was uh, called Legoland. Y'all been to Legoland? God bless us all. <laughs> but as you go into Legoland, obviously there's a lot of Legos, right? And so you get there, and there's this area where you can go in and you can build, you know, little, uh, kind of like little cars and stuff out of Legos, and they got these ramps, and you can drop them and send them down and let them do all the jumps, and ultimately they just break and fall apart, okay? But they got all these things going on. But as I thought about that of Legoland, I thought about what I'm good at building at Legos. You see, I have Legos in my house. Those of you who have young children know that these are extremely expensive little Legos. Right, parents? Right, we have all these little Legos. And all of a sudden, yeah, over the years, I've watched my kids take their Legos, and they will just take something, and they will build it, and next thing you know, it's just this huge contraption. It's this huge thing, and they're really proud of it. And they bring it to us, and we as parents go, oh, that's great. Look at what you've done. What is it? You know, right? And so all of a sudden, they bring these to us. You know, whenever I think about spiritually, I think a lot of times I feel like I'm okay by myself. I feel like, you know, I've got my walk with God, and and, and I've got my ministry, and I've got my mission, and I've got my purpose. I'm okay. I don't need the church. I don't need to be there to worship with the saints. I don't need to be there to be fed and to be rejuvenated through Bible class. I, I, I can just do this thing by myself. But as I look at this idea of being built into a spiritual house, and I, and I really thought about building uh, what I would call a spiritual house, but... For illustrative, this is our spiritual house, okay? We're stronger together. We're stronger together. As you go into Legoland, there is a seven-foot Lego statue of Dirk. And when you get really, really close, if you don't know who Dirk is, and you need to leave the Metroplex, Okay? <laughs> But as you get closer, you begin to look and you begin to see all these little pieces with the bigger pieces. And they all come together to form, and you can tell it's dirt. And I began thinking about what a beautiful illustration that is for you and I today. To know that we are all little pieces, that we are part of the spiritual household, and that when we come together, some beautiful things can happen. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst? I think a lot of times we read this verse and we say, you know, see, look, it's a, it's a singular concept. It's this, this singular idea. And while to an extent that may be true throughout the first few chapters of 1 Corinthians, I believe what Paul is writing here is, I believe this, don't you know that y'all are God's temple? It's not about us being individual pieces. Yes, are we individually a piece of the temple? Are we individually uh, uh, saints? Absolutely. And priests? Absolutely. But when we come together, we form the temple. We form the church. And the world is watching. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but your fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. 
Jesus is the chief cornerstone. He is the one in which we have built our faith upon, his death, his burial, his resurrection. We have built our foundation upon the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he is the one that allows us to be joined together perfectly for the Lord himself. In closing, I want to look at this question. Let's go back to Euodia and Synthache, and I ask a question, did they resolve the disagreement did they resolve the disagreement? I want to tell you, for the longest time, I had no idea. In fact, it was one of my questions whenever I got to heaven. But in my study, I came across this, which I found was very interesting. It says that we have some indirect historical evidence that perhaps that these two ladies did reconcile. For early in the second century, the church in Philippi wrote to Polycarp. They asked about another minister who was arrested and taken to Rome. We don't have their letter, but Polycarp's reply was preserved. He said this. He says, They have followed the example of true love and have helped on their way. An opportunity offered those who were bound in chains. Then he adds, he says, I rejoice also that you are firmly rooted faith, renowned since early days, endures to the present, and produces fruit for our Lord Jesus Christ. As I read this, I began realizing that these words could not only be spoken about a congregation that had developed and maintained godly unity. So the question is, can we conclude that Euodia and Synthache resolved their differences? The answer is lost in history, but perhaps Polycarp's letter gives us some indirect reassurance that they did. Food for thought. But here's my final slide. What is currently be, being written about this body of believers here in Louisville? When people get on social media and they see the way that we talk about one another, when they see the way that we speak about the church, whenever they see the things that we individually as these building blocks, the things that we put out there, is our language pure or is our language that, well, frankly, of the devil? What do people see when they see the Louisville Church of Christ? In the future, what will be said about this congregation? Will they say that we are a unified church, a body of believers that love being together, that are focusing to become more and more like, the, like Jesus and the relationship that he has with his Father? Or are we going to be known as a congregation that was so busy that we only focused upon ourselves? Biblical unity is a beautiful thing, church. And so I, I implore, I beg, just as Paul did, that we make every effort to be unified in service, in love, and in spirit. That is the lesson this morning. If any way this lesson has caused you to reflect and you realize that you are not where you need to be with Jesus in your relationship with him, you have an opportunity this morning to make that right. There may be also here, some here this morning who have not put on their Lord in baptism. You've not been willing to, to confess his good name, to repent of your sins, and to be immersed in the watery grave of baptism. We can take care of that this morning. I also want to say that there may be also some here this morning that, you know, you just got some questions. You want to study more about maybe this subject or about the gospel, whatever it is. I know we've got a lot of people that love to study with other individuals, and so we can take care of that for you. If you need to respond in any way, please come forward now as we stand and as we sing.